Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, does anybody remember what we were talking about last week? Are things, so many things happen in a week that um, anybody remember what we were talking about? Talking about the judges, the Sanhedrin who were, could be corrupted. Yes, That's you're it. right. We were talking about the potentially corrupt judges. We were talking about this very weird, um, almost counterintuitive halacha which says that if all the judges think he's guilty, he walks free. The unanimous verdict. And we were going through this article, um, which uh, was by um, Rabbi Ephraim Glatt. Um, and we spoke last week about the idea that um, if a Sanhedrin were all of one mind, then it smells fishy. And then we would be worried that there would be collusion between the judges. Um, that was one uh, idea. Another idea that we spoke about um, was the, 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 the one that I preferred, which was the Ramah. Um, <clears throat> who said that actually uh, it doesn't sound, it's not what it looks like. When it said potrin, which we translate as he goes free, it means that he is made nifta. Remember we talk about nifta, we talked about calling somebody dead, we're using that word. Um, yeah. He's considered <laughs> dead straight away um, um, and because everybody thinks he's guilty. They don't sleep on it overnight. And he is executed straight away. Um, that was the explanation that personally I liked the best, even though it was a bit of a kvetch on the words. The reason being that all the other explanations are a kvetch on the mind. Um, and it, it, I'm finding it very difficult to, uh, to really uh, engage with these explanations. So we had the explanation that um, the... Sanhedrin must be dodgy in some way if they all feel the same way. We also um, quoted the next piece of Gomorrah a bit early on, which said that a person who uh, is in the Sanhedrin has to be so clever that he can prove the unprovable. Um, and therefore, since nobody in this Sanhedrin has stood up and said, well, this guy might be innocent, they haven't done their job properly. Um, that was one of the opinions. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the Maharal's opinion. Um, um, so we then finished with um, uh, a question that we were going to ask, uh, and we said we'd do it this week, and that is to look at this from a different angle. And to, to, to first of all ask the question, what is the point of punishment? So I shall ask the question, what is the point of punishment? Why do we have punishment in general? When a court imposes a punishment, what is the reason? Let's talk about, for example, um, a fine. It's you do something wrong when you get a fine. What's the point of that punishment? Stop other people doing it. Okay, it's a deterrent. deterrent. That, is, that is one of the main uh, um, reasons for punishing. It's a deterrent. Because if you did not get three points and a £150 fine when you went over the speed limit, then we'd all do it. I'll so go for the course. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, listen, when you've got on those courses, by the time you've got, okay, got yeah. through an hour, you're willing, you're wishing to take the points and pay the money to get out. Have you ever been on one of those, Michael? No. Oh, I've been on a few over the years. They're horrendous. I, I, it, they're horrendous. There's three and a half hours of of I, I willingly take the points and and and. So it wasn't a deterrent. So uh, um, so they are a deterrent because you know you do wants to sit through that. I once said to the bloke actually, um, 
uh, they, they had a break after about an hour and a half. And I said, to, I said, you do know, don't you, that research has shown that um, the maximum attention span of a human being is, is uh, 30 minutes. Um, actually, it's less now. Um, but um, uh, uh, so, you know, what's the point of this three hour course? You know, he looked at me like I was completely bonkers. And he says, it's a punishment, you idiot. <laughs> You're not here to learn anything. It's a punishment. Uh, and uh, anyway, so that was the it's a deterrent. So punishments can be a deterrent. That is true. What else can punishment be? Retribution. Retribution. Correct. Retribution. So um, that's a little bit more sort of basic, isn't it? Uh, um, deterrent is a bit more sophisticated than retribution. Um, you're a naughty boy and I'm going to smack your bottom. Right? I'm smacking your bottom so that you won't do it again. That's deterrent. And I'm smacking your bottom because you deserve it, because you've done a very naughty thing. Um, so um, it's very interesting. If you look at the two different legal systems, shame we haven't got any Americans with us today, but maybe they will watch the recording and comment uh, to us. If you look at the difference between the um, UK and American system, uh, of civil justice, uh, something that, as you probably know, I'm heavily involved in in the UK um, uh, with my uh, clinical negligence work. Damages are uh, awarded in the UK on the basis of causation. What do I mean by that? Any idea what I mean by that? The damage caused? Yeah, yeah. So in other words... If let's take my my line of work, if a uh, surgeon in the middle of an operation takes off his gloves, rubs his hands in the soil and then carries on operating, everybody would agree that that is a negligent act. But if the patient recovers well and does not get an appointment uh, and does not get an infection from the dirty hands of the surgeon, and everything goes smoothly and he recovers as he would have normally recovered if he hadn't done such a thing, then there is no liability. In other words, the surgeon is not liable for anything. He's been negligent. There has been a breach of his duty of care, but there has been no causation. That breach of duty of care did not cause any damage. And therefore, in British law, he does not receive any damages. Now, let's say the guy does get an infection and he has to spend another week in hospital and he has a lot of pain um, and um, which he would not have had on had the surgeon not done such a silly thing and such a negligent thing. He will then be awarded damages in the UK according to the amount of uh, upset that has been caused to him, either physically or psychologically. And there are various different case law and tables that you can look in to see how much this amount of uh, um, upset is worth and how much that amount of upset is worth. That is a... Um, that is a... Um, sort of a retributive... Uh, punishment for the surgeon because he's no you're right to pull a face Michael because that's not the right word is it that is a uh, a um, an award for the patient to compensate for what has happened to him now in the US there is something called punitive damages which we don't have in the UK so in our case the chap might be awarded, I don't know, let's say $10,000 for his pain and suffering that he's got. A court may then award another million dollars as punitive damages, which has the effect of being A, a deterrent, because that surgeon is not going to do that again. And anybody reading that case is not going to do the same thing because they don't want to be uh, uh, 
liable for that sort of money. And it's also retribution, the punishment for this particular surgeon who's done that. We don't have that in the UK. We don't have punitive or retributive damages. So <coughs> um, there's different ways of looking at things. Now, what we're going to see now is that according to um, at least two um, famous uh, rabbis, there's another angle to punishment. And that is punishment as spiritual cleansing. What do I mean by that? Any idea? You do, you do teshuva after you've done the sin. Yeah, it, it's it's almost a bit it's almost a bit Christian, that isn't it? Yeah. Really, that you you get cleansed through a punishment. The Christian bit, of course, is that Jesus took your punishment and you get cleansed by believing in Jesus, and you then don't have to have the punishment. But the idea of being cleansed through punishment um, is uh, certainly something which is um, so certainly got a bit of a Christian feel to it. David, you've read this article. What do you think about this idea of you're, you're muted, David? What do you think this I, you think of this idea of, of punishment being a spiritual cleansing? We'll go through it in a bit more detail in a minute, but I'm interested to know your view. Well, sorry, because it, it's over a month now since uh, you distributed the, that article, and I haven't looked at it again since, unfortunately. Um, that that sits fine uh, for, for someone that, that has a religious nature. So, for example, you look at the, the, the current situation, there may be some Israelis who think enough is enough, uh, let's turn the other cheek because Hashem will avenge the the, the terrible events of 7th of October. And yeah, we, we spoke about this in the, in the Tefillah Shir because we, uh -huh. we, when we were doing Avinu Malkenu, I spoke about Nakom Nikmat Dama Vadech HaShafuch. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure there's a, <clears throat> a complete parallel there because... We would say, at least I would say, that what we are doing in Gaza is not retribution or deterrent. It is, uh, a, 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 it is a removal of the possibility of it happening again. If we, if we stick with our medical analogy, it's cutting out the cancer. Preventative. Yeah, it's cutting out the cancer. There is a cancer in there um, and you cut it out. Now, when you cut out a cancer, if you've got a cancer that, that is that big, you don't just cut out that cancer. You cut out an area around that cancer of healthy tissue. Now, that healthy tissue didn't do anything wrong. That hasn't caused you any issue. But because um, the healthy tissue surrounds the cancer and feeds the cancer, you have to take what we call a wide margin. You take a wide margin to make sure that you don't leave one single cancer cell left. Because from one single cancer cell, you can then develop, God forbid, a recurrence of the cancer. And that is how I see what we're trying to do in... A uh, very good analogy. Yeah, that's how I see it. Maybe I'll write about that sometime in one of the articles that I have to write. I've written about, uh, this week you'll see, if you read it, I've written about, um, it's called Ideology Versus Philosophy. Um, and it advocates a stronger um, um, position that we ought to take. But anyway, uh, but this idea of cutting out a cancer with a wide margin, that, that healthy tissue um, didn't do anything wrong. It was just unfortunate that it happened to be in the vicinity of the cancer. Um, and it's it's a uh, it's a collateral damage, if you like. You have to take that wide margin. You know, I, I, I've seen one second, David. I've seen yeah. many times um, people who have uh, a melanoma, which is a very aggressive can skin cancer. And I'm thinking of one particular patient I saw who had a small melanoma on his forehead. The scar that he ended up with was huge because they had to make sure they got rid of every single 
cancer cell. And that's how I see this as we're going. There's no question that there are some people who see this as retribution and it would not be human not to want to give retribution considering what's gone on. Um, the deterrent is important. We've lived on the deterrent in Israel for many, many years. And the fact is our deterrent um, had waned over the last few years. And that's why it's happened in the first place, because it was no longer, a uh, our deterrent was no longer a deterrent. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting analogy. Um, but, but to me, this is, this is cancer surgery. This is rather than retribution, but, you know, each person has his own view on that. David. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the case of second degree or accidental murder, where the uh, perpetrator uh, goes to Aray Miklat, it's a city of refuge, uh, is there not um, a rabbinic prescription there that he doesn't get off scot-free, but uh, there will be some kind of retribution, uh, like for like, for the the negligence um, and the result of that negligence, i.e. that something similar will happen to him sometime in the future. OK, and how does that occur? You are right, of course. How, how does that occur? By, by uh, divine uh, action. Correct. Bidei Shamayim, we would say in Hebrew, right? Yeah. Bidei Shamayim. Hold that thought, because that is exactly what we're going to talk about now. Uh, because the two opinions that we're going to discuss now about this unanimous verdict where the guy goes free brings in this complete, this idea that you've just mentioned there. Um, but before we get to that, we have to understand this added dimension of punishment as a spiritual cleansing, as opposed to the standard idea that we've devote, we've all um, agreed on, which is retribution uh, and uh, deterrence. OK, retribution and deterrence, we understand clearly. Now, I don't know how it works, Johnny, but don't the Catholics go to the priest? They don't get any punishment, just... Uh, you just admit they've done something wrong, and he, he said, uh, "Off you go." Yeah, they have she to do. Their, they have Don't, to do their whatever uh, they yeah. have to do. Yeah, they have to do their 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 act of contrition. The idea for the Christians is that um, all you actually have to do is to believe in Jesus, uh, because Jesus died for your sins, so He took your punishment. The fact that Jesus was was crucified and went through all that He went through. Um, was for you, not you personally, of course, uh, but um, but for the the, the Christian believers, uh, that is called the the doctrine of vicarious punishment. Okay, he took the pen punishment for you. Uh, where do we see? By the way, it's not just a Christian idea. Where do we see um, vicarious punishment? Uh, at least being suggested in the Torah. With the Azazel, is it? Sorry, in the oh, okay, okay, yes, that, that, that's, yes, I'll buy that. Yeah. The, the, the goat of Azazel, as it were, takes the punishment for us. And, uh, and you could say the same for Caporus. Yeah. Um, 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 which I don't necessarily hold off, but still. We're not going to go into that today. Uh, I'm talking about a story in the Torah itself, um, which is, uh, smacks of vicarious punishment or a vicarious, uh, um, uh, yeah, vicarious punishment. Who can read my obscure mind? The donkey. The donkey. The result. Yeah. The result that eventually he dies in a battle. He's 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 killed in a battle at a later stage after taking all the ah, money. Okay, so that's a good example of, of of what David was saying before, which is that delayed punishment bide shamayim through the hand of heaven. I'm talking about vicarious punishment where somebody else takes it, takes the rap, or at least tries to take the rap. 
Am I giving you enough clues? Okay, uh, I'll try and give you another clue. I'll, I'll tell you where it is. It's in Sefer Bereshit. No, not yet. I'll give you another clue. It's in the beginning of Parashat Vayigash. What did Yehuda say to Yosef? Who was going to be punished when Binyamin was caught with the cup after it had been planted in his sack? Binyamin. Binyamin. Yosef Binyamin. said, right, what did Yosef say? Binyamin, right, you, you're a thief. You can be my slave. The rest of you, go back to Canaan. And what does Yehuda say? Vayigashi love Yehuda. Take me, take me in his place. Yeah. Take, take me in his place. Let him off, and I'll be the slave. Yehuda was willing to be the vicarious, well, the recipient of vicarious punishment there on behalf of uh, Binyamin. Um, so um, that's an example of vicarious punishment. Uh, but the, the 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 Christian belief is that well, Jesus died um, to absolve the sins of all those who believe in Him. How did we get onto that? I've no idea. Anyway, well, well, you, spiritual, you lost... spiritual punishment. You oh yeah, spiritual cleansing. That's right. Cleansing. How how many times does Moses say to Hashem? You know, kill me rather than the Jewish people. Yeah, but that's not quite what Moshe's saying, is it? He's not saying, I'll take the rap for the Jewish people. He's saying, I don't want to be part of your game if you're not going to forgive them. He's not saying, I'll take the rap. He's saying, cut me out. I don't want to be part of your team if you're going to punish the Jewish people. Not quite the same thing. I've had enough, he says. Yeah, I've had enough of this. No, no, no. There, there, there's also a uh, way says, uh, Haragani na, na Harog. Please kill me. That's because he doesn't want to see the punishment of the Jewish people. Ooh. He doesn't say, as Yehuda says, uh, I'll take it on me. That's not, I, I don't, uh, that's not how I read it anyway. Anyway, let's go on and have a look at this idea of punishment as spiritual cleansing. Um, uh, so there are um, various Talmudic commentaries who view punishment as a means to cleanse the person of his sins. What do we say at the end of Vidui? on Yom Kippur. See if I've got any. I might actually still have a Yom Kippur matzo here. I do. By pure chance, I have my Yom Kippur matzo on my desk. Actually, it's not chance. Um, the reason I've got it on my desk is that uh, I, um, I'm i such an untidy desk, I haven't put it away from the time when we were going through the, the Yom Kippur davening. So um, here we go. Now, what do we say? We say... Here we go. We say right at the end of Vidui, Yehira Tzon Milafanecha Adonai Leinu time. May it be your will, Hashem, my God and the God of my fathers. Shelo echete od. I shall not sin again. Uma shechatati lefanecha. And that which I have sinned before you, Marek Berachamecha Harabim. Marek means to clean, cleanse, to cleanse. Cleanse with your abundant mercy. Aval, but, who knows the next few words? David? You're, you're muted, David. Lo uh, b'yisurin. Yes, almost, almost exactly. Well done. Aval lo al yidei yisurim. V'chalayim ra'im. And not, but not through Yisurim, suffering, V'chalayim ra'im, or, or, or bad illness, serious illness. So we're asking a Baruch Hu to cleanse our sins 
through mercy and not by the usual method of cleansing oneself from sins, which is through punishment. The fact that we are asking God to give us mercy and not punish us for our sins and cleanse ourselves. And it actually talks about this marik, barachamech harabim, wipe them away. That's what marik means, wipe them away. Uh, the modern Hebrew word marak is soup. I wonder what the connection there is. Don't know. Can't think of one off the top of my head. Anybody that can come up with a connection between marik barachamech harabim and chicken soup, um, can uh, can go into Chidushe Poleg when, when it's written. Doesn't Marek mean distance? That's yeah. Rachok. Oh, Rachok. Well, Rachok. Similar word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, by this expression here, loyal yidei yisurim v'chalayim ra'im, what we're saying is the usual way to cleanse oneself of sin, or to be cleansed of sin, is through punishment. And that is uh, demonstrated by this, this Talmudic idea that punishment is not just retribution and it's not just uh, deterrent. It's also a method of cleansing one's sins. OK, so that's an important uh, starting point before we look at the uh, idea um, of two um, fairly modern rabbis uh, as to what this Gemara is talking about. Remember, the Gemara said that a uh, court, in, in a court case where all the judges, it's a capital case, remember, a capital case where all 71 judges, meaning this is the appeal court, because as we said previously, a capital case is normally tried by how many judges? 23. Correct, 23. Um, they all found him guilty, presumably. It was sent upstairs to the big Sanhedrin. They all found him guilty. The Gemara says he goes free. And once we understand that the purpose of punishment can be one of cleansing sins, we can now go on to um, understand and have a look at the uh, um, explanations of two particular rabbis who are both called Menachem Mendel, as it so happens. We'll start with probably, for us, the most famous Menachem Mendel of all. Who am I talking about? Who's the most famous Menachem Mendel? The Rebbe. The Rebbe. The Rebbe. The Rebbe. Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Yes, Menachem Mendel Schneerson the uh, last Lubavitcher ever. Um, interestingly enough, um, this article is clearly not written by a Lubavitcher because it says, um, when he quotes Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, says in brackets, died 1994. Okay, so David, David has got the point. Um, of course, Hamavin uh, Yomit. Uh, anyway, Rabbi Menachem Mandel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, said like this about our Mishnah. He says, um, he brings another uh, interesting case, which you'll be familiar with. That case is Adim Zomamin. You know what Adim Zomamin are? What's Adim? Witnesses. Adim Zomamin? Dishonest witnesses. Yeah, excellent. Very good, Johnny. Dishonest or false witnesses. Do you, do you know the halacha of, of that? What happens with that? They get the punishment. They were trying to put on somebody else. Very good. So yeah. you have a situation whereby two witnesses come along and they say, on Monday afternoon at three o'clock, we saw with our very own eyes that... Chaim Yankel killed Ruvin. We warned him. We said, don't do it. Um, we both said the same thing. Don't do it. We both said, if you do it, you'll be chai of Misa. You'll have to have, you'll be chai of the death penalty. And he didn't listen to us. And he went ahead and he killed him. And we saw it. Now, at this point, Ruvain 
Uh, he's in a bit of trouble, is he not? No, Reuben's dead. Chaim Yankel, right, um, who was the uh, alleged murderer, is in a bit of trouble because he's got two witnesses that have given testimony and have ticked all the boxes. What's going to happen to Chaim Yankel? Actually, he's probably so, not. He's going he's to be so. stoned. He's not going to be. He's not going to be beheaded. He's going to be stoned. Stealer. Yeah. So he's going to die. He's going to get the death penalty. Along comes two other witnesses, and what do they say? They say we saw those two witnesses weren't there. No. Yes, they come along and they say, "Wait a minute! <laughs> those two witnesses could not have seen Chaim Yankel kill Ruvain at Monday afternoon at three o'clock." Because on Monday afternoon at three o'clock, they were with sitting next to us at Old Trafford watching the test match. They were not in the vicinity of this murder. And we know that because we were with them. Now, the problem we have with that is, how do you know which set of witnesses are telling the truth? Well, that's how... That's why you have to be a clever judge, which is the next piece of Gomorrah, by the way, to work it out. But if the court believes the second set of witnesses, uh, the Torah says very clearly that whatever it was, the punishment that was going to go be given to Chaim Yankel is now given to, uh, on the... Uh, the aging Zomamin, the, the, the false witnesses. So they would then, in our example, they would then be uh, killed. We all know that halacha, right? Except um, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe brings a, another angle to that law, and that is the following. According to many commentators, if the punishment has already been given out to Chaim Yankel, in other words, in our case, he's already been put to death, the Adim Zomamim do not receive that punishment. Now, Michael has got a completely blank look on his face because he doesn't understand that. Well, how do we understand that? How does that, how can that be? You would have imagined that somebody who gives, who causes, who almost causes somebody to have a punishment gets punishment X. You would think that somebody who actually causes somebody else to get a punishment unnecessarily would get at least X and maybe more. Don't know what can be worse than death, but you would think that, wouldn't you? And in, according to the Rebbe, According to many commentators, it is not um, um, it, it's not the case. Now, Rabbi Yosef Karo, what was he most famous for? Shulchan Aruch. Was it Shulchan Aruch? He was the author of the Shulchan Aruch. Um, Rabbi Yosef Karo says that the reason for this is that punishment is in order to cleanse the soul. Okay? And somebody who does such a terrible thing that actually causes somebody to be punished, in other words, to be put to death, in our case, Chaim Yankel, those Adim Zomamin who've caused his death, punishment is not sufficient to cleanse his, his sin. His sin is so great that um, death is not sufficient to cleanse his punishment. And we are therefore, he walks free from the human court. And we leave it to our Kaddish Baruch Hu to do what is necessary to punish this person. Maybe in Olam Azer, maybe in Olam Abba. Who knows? So what he says here is, he must walk free, leaving his punishment in the hands of God, a surely worse fate. Likewise, says the Rebbe, a defendant unanimously convicted 
is undeserving of punishment by the hands of mere mortals. Instead, this heinous crime must be judged by the master judge, the Lord himself. And therefore, the person who is judged unanimously to be guilty has done something so bad that not even one of the 71 incredibly clever judges who are so clever that they can prove the unprovable see fit to find him innocent. And that is so bad that human punishment is not enough. And therefore, we leave it to God. And that, says Rav Schneerson, is the rationale for this anti-unanimous law. Um, and as somebody pointed out, I can't remember which one of you it was, that really only works if you've got a religious perspective. If you don't have a religious perspective, um, you think you've got away literally with murder. Because if you don't have, if you have a religious perspective and you then are told, well, you are so bad that we can't, we haven't got enough punishments for you. We're going to leave it to God to punish you. And you believe in God. That actually is a terrible punishment because you're then going through every single day of your life. Sorry. Expecting the thunderbolt from heaven, whatever it's going to be. Um, and that is, that actually is a dreadful punishment. So but, isn't there a but isn't there a concern here that if, if say, something it was, it was a, a murder, that this person would actually commit further murders as a result of not being put to death originally? OK, so there's our, our there's our cancer argument again, isn't it? We've got to cut the cancer out and get rid of him, um, because what you're saying is there's no deterrent because he doesn't believe in this whole business. Um uh, and and um, and maybe that's a second angle. Maybe he, the the punishment is not carried out. The, the but maybe he is um, incarcerated. I don't know. Possible. It's possible that he's incarcerated not as a punishment, but as a means to prevent him from doing something again. I mean that that's definitely a, a possibility. I agree with that. Um, so it's an interesting idea. This idea that um, uh, human punishment is not enough for some people, uh, and and we we we've we've, we've uh, you, we can sort of relate to that a bit because we 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 can sometimes relate to the idea to say that you know I hope he dies a long, slow, lingering, painful death, okay. Because death is too good for him. A person can be so bad. These evil, wicked, terrible, whatever adjective you can think of, people that did these things on September 7th, uh, October 7th on Simchat Torah. Um, a swift, painless death um, is not good enough to punish them. It needs to be much worse than that. And maybe that's the idea here. I'm not quite sure in my own mind that I am religious enough, believing enough uh, to, to actually get it and to like it and to accept it. Uh, you know, that's, that's my problem. Um, it, to me, it, it's, uh, it doesn't sit well with me. But I can understand that a man like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was clearly a, a person of immense belief, immense intellect, an Adam Gadol by anybody's standards. Maybe somebody on that sort of madrega can, can see something that I can't see, um, that this is a, a logical and a, a rational explanation for this anti-unanimous law. Um, I have, I'll be honest, it's, it, it, I, I, I'm struggling with it, but I'm presenting it to you because um, uh, it's there and it's important that we understand the Gomorrah in, in detail. All right, so that's 
Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Yes, David, you want to say something? Yeah, can I tell you, Le, le Havdil, Elef Havdala. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity yet to see the drama, the BBC drama about Jim, Jimmy Savile. Not yet. Okay, it, it's, it's astonishing. And uh, it, again, it, it hammers home the point of his Roman Catholic belief. And the opportunities he had to confess his sins uh, before he died uh, in order to be accepted by the Roman Catholic Church at that time. Um, and there, there are interviews with some of his victims as well. And you get the same kind of sense that... If someone was uh, classically a victim of his, just as um, here's the real comparison, that as far as I'm aware, no one in this group has actually suffered uh, uh, direct con consequences of what happened on the 7th of October. But had Rahman al-Islam, we suffered a personal tragedy uh, we would probably feel the same, that nothing, no retribution whatsoever would ever compensate for what we went through and what our Krovin went through, whether it's the 7th of October, whether it's the Shah, whether it's any terrorist um, um, happenings, uh, not just the formation of the state, but well before the formation of the state. Nothing can compensate. I think I think that's right. I think the concept that um, a a punishment is not enough. There aren't enough bad things that you can do to a person as retribution. That bit I get. The bit I'm struggling with is that he walks free in this mm. court of law. Mm. What I would be saying to the Lubavitcher Rebbe if he was here and I was fortunate enough to be able to discuss this with him, I would say, why can't we do both? Why can't we punish him? And we say, like we say with the Averas that we do, Ben Odom the Chavera, we say that Yom Kippur does not atone for those. Why can't we do the same? Why can't we say, right, well, we'll give you this punishment, but don't think that that's all of it. You're going to get punishment from God as well. The answer he might give me, and I'm going to answer my own question, is to say that, no, that is the demonstration of a man who lacks faith. Because if you really believe in a Kaddish Baruch Hu, you'll believe that a Kaddish Baruch Hu will give justice, retribution um, to the perpetrators of these crimes. Uh, and I think that that's why I said before that you have to be a Lubavitch Rebbe type person to really grasp this concept no not to grasp it but to accept it fully exactly. and i i'm i'm struggling with it be honest with you i'm struggling with it uh but i do see that a person like the lubavitcher rebbe um could have somebody with the most phenomenal belief remember the lubavitcher rebbe uh, when discussing the holocaust was the one voice in post-holocaust theology who said i'm not going to offer any thoughts on this I'm not going to offer any explanations. It is beyond man's possible knowledge. We just have to say we don't know. It's a Kaddish Baruch Hu's will. That's all we can say. The Satma Rebbe said, It was because of the sin of, of, of Zionism. Other people said because it was the sin of, 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 of um, assimilation. Uh, others said it was because of the sin of of, of anti-Zionism, because you didn't you become a Zionist. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was the one senior figure who said, this is not a conversation we can have. We have to leave it to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And, of course, in the words of Pinky, in the time comes, we can take Kaddish Baruch Hu to a Din Torah. Din Torah. But, but um, so it, it, this, this idea here that we're discussing now of, of, of the Lubavitcher Rebbe actually fits with that response of his uh, after the, the Shoah. And that is that there are certain things that are so incomprehensible and are so bad that we have to leave them to a Kaddish Baruch Hu.
And I think it's consistent with his with his uh, view on that. And so whilst I personally struggle with accepting that, I um, acknowledge that a great person like um, Rab Menachem Mendel Schneerson, um, who apparently died in 1994, uh, is uh, a great person who could grasp that concept. Okay, let's move on in the last few minutes to the second... What would he think point. the retribution has been then for the Holocaust? Who thinks? <laughs> no, that's a Kodesh Baruch Hu's business. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, who knows? Uh, each individual will have got their ret retribution. That we have to believe. What it is, why should I need to know about it? I'd like to know about it, but am I so important that Kodesh Baruch Hu should let me in on his... Well, the baddies got killed in the end. Well, they did. The baddies got killed in the end. Unfortunately, there were a lot of collateral damage on the way. Yeah. But I think there's a, there's, there is a, a certain humility that we need to have as well. You know, am I so important that Kodesh Baruch Hu should share his uh, uh, things with me? He didn't share it with Moshe Rabbeinu. Told Moshe Rabbeinu, sorry, Moshe, you can only see the back of me. You can only get a slight idea of what I'm all about. And so who the hell am I? That I should ask and, and demand an explanation from the Almighty. That's arrogance. Can't, you know, uh, we see it, we hear it. I want to know why. Sorry, but, you know, uh, the answer that he gave, the Godish Baruch Hu gave to Eiv. When you're God, you'll understand. If you could do the things that I can do, you'd understand, but you can't. It's like saying to a child, trying to ex explain to a two-year-old quantum physics theory. Can't possibly. But you can say to him, you know what, when you're older and you've studied, like I've studied, and you've got, you know, your 14 degrees in quantum physics, then you'll understand what I'm saying. But right now, you're a little boy and you don't understand. I think Rabbi Wise said that if you if you actually understand, if you can say that you understand this, that, and the other, said, you're God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so I, I can understand the concept, and although I'm struggling with the idea that this guy walks away. Okay, let's have a look at the second Menachem Mendel I wanted to discuss, whose opinion I wanted to discuss. Um, and... Um, he is uh, a man called Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern. Anybody know who that was? Also a famous Menachem Mendel, not as famous to us at least as the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. David, do you know who Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern was? I heard of him. You will know him by his uh, acronym, known as the Kotzka Rebbe. Okay. Kotzka Rebbe. Yeah. The Kotzka Rebbe. Um, Kotsk. Anyone know where Kotsk is? Have a guess. Lithuania. Close. To uh, Poland. Poland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's it's a town in Poland. Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, the Kotsk Rebbe, born 1787, died in 1859. Um, a very interesting man, actually. I didn't know any of this till I looked him up. Um, he uh, is the uh, spiritual founder, as it were, of the Ger dynasty. So the Geir Hasidim, um, which uh, um, which started in Poland, uh, bases its teachings on the Kotzka Rebbe, which I didn't know. And something really interesting is uh, that he was born to a non-Hasidic family. And he became, he, uh, he, he was a Baal Tshuva into the Hasidic movement. He wasn't a Baal Tshuva. He was born into a, 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 a very holy family, but not a Hasidic family. Um, and um, he was a student of Reb Bunim of Pshischa. You heard of Reb Bunim of Pshischa? Another famous Rebbe. You've never heard of him, Michael. Uh, okay, well, you need, you need to read the Torah tidbits more often then. Because he's often quoted in the Torah tidbits these days, Reb Bunim of Peshischa. Anyway, um, he, uh, the, the Kotzka Rebbe, was famous for being very sharp. He did not suffer fools gladly. 
and he was famous for um, very sort of pithy sayings. Um, some of them you will uh, be, you'll recognize, but you might not have known that he said them. Uh, one of the things that he said was when asked about God and why we didn't understand exactly what we're talking about here, he says, what kind of God would he be if I could understand him? Which is another way of saying what, what Rabbi Weiss said. You know, what kind of God would he be if I could understand him? It's a bit like Groucho Marx, La Havdil, Elef Hevdolus, who said didn't want to be part of a club that would have him as a member. <laughs> right? What kind of God would it be if I could understand him? Um, he also said something else which you might have heard. Um, and he says, um, and I quoted this, and I didn't know it was from, uh, from the Kotzka Rebbe. Um, I, I said it so slightly differently, but the idea is the same. He says, um, somebody who says they love fish does not love fish. If you love the fish, you wouldn't have killed it and cooked it on a fire. Right? You love yourself um, and you love uh, the fish because you love yourself. You love eating the fish. You don't love the fish. Um, anyway. Uh, you love Ali Shabbos cooking. I think yes, so. that's right. Correct. <laughs> you, you, you heard me say it before. Many times. Um, uh, so I didn't know that was a Kotzka Rebbe, but there you are. Anyway, the Kotzka Rebbe, um, um, bearing in mind what he said about God, that what kind of a God would be if I could understand him, he said it also said, ex, um, explains Al Gemara on the basis of spiritual cleansing, but in a slightly different angle. And he says that... Um, he agrees with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. By the way, he, he predates the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So it's not that he agrees with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but he agrees with the point that the Lubavitcher Rebbe made, which is that the point of the punishment is to cleanse the sinner's soul. Uh, but he differs on how this cleansing happens. What he says is that the point of a Sanhedrin is not to punish. It's not to maintain the rule of law, it is to um, help a person come to the internal realization that he's done wrong and to regret his actions. Okay. Usually, the punishment is brought about in order to help the person come to that realization that they've done wrong. So if you're sat in prison for 20 years, you've got 20 years to cogitate on what you've done wrong. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's the idea of punishment, says the Kotzka Rebbe. However, when you have a Sanhedrin which unanimously convicts someone, the Kotzka Rebbe says a person will surely regret his actions immediately when he sees that not one of these 71 very clever people who can prove the unprovable has seen fit to say that I could possibly be innocent, then I must be a right rotter. I must be a terrible person. And that in itself is sufficient, says the Kotzka Rebbe, to make him immediately regret what he did and to be cleansed of his sins because of his regret. Uh, and therefore, says the Kotzka Rebbe, different to what um, Rav Schneerson says, Rav Schneerson says, we can't punish him enough. He's so bad that we have to leave the punishment to God. The Kotzka Rebbe says, we don't need to punish him at all. The mere fact that he has got a unanimous verdict against him is sufficient to do the job of making him regret his actions, and therefore he is cleansed. And therefore, there is no need for punishment. Um, and then Rabbi Glatt, who quotes this, um, um, puts into words what we're all thinking. He says, this is perhaps overly favourable in his assessment of the inherent goodness of human behavior. Um, and I think we were probably all thinking that, you know, that 
Um, a person who's done such a bad thing is not likely to be the kind of person who's going to regret it without a punishment. He's going to walk away more than likely and think he's got away with murder. Murder. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, what Gil Rabbi Gilbert Mack Sullivan, famous opera, said the punishment fits the crime. I can't remember the song. It was a great song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't fits. remember it either. But I, I, punishment fits the crime. It, it's uh, um, it's 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 familiar to me as well, vaguely. Um, so, um, the Gemara saw fit to give us a very superficial answer to the question of why he goes free. And if you remember, the Gemara's uh, um, answer was because um, there's, they, they, there's nothing for them to think about overnight. Um, and therefore, it's a procedural thing. I think Avril was the one that said that it was a procedural issue why he walked away. It was a bit of a, a loophole, a bit of a, uh, a um, what was the word um, that you used, uh, um, Avril, it was a, begins with a T, technical. It was a technical, uh, it got off on a technicality. Um, that's what the Gemara says. But Rabbi Glatt has given us four different approaches, really. He's given us the approach of um, the Rama, who says it doesn't mean what you think it means. It means that he's killed straight away. Um, he then gave us the idea of Rav Tzvi Hirsch Chayas and, uh, and the Maharal, um, who um, said that uh, um, it, there, there must be something, there must be something dodgy about the Sanhedrin itself, uh, and maybe they'll get a retrial. And then we've got the two that we went through today, uh, Rav uh, Schneerson, who says this guy is so bad that man cannot punish, punish, him, punish him sufficiently and we leave it to God. And then finally, the Kotzka Rebbe, who um, looks on people with such uh, benevolence that he says that surely a person who is convicted unanimously by 71 judges will look at himself, feel bad, regret his actions, be cleansed from his sin and not therefore require any punishment at all. Um, so, uh, an, a very interesting uh, uh, idea, really, of this unanimous verdict, which at very first level, and I suppose even at the end of all that, it's still a bit difficult, isn't it, um, to, to, to grasp the idea that a person who's unanimously convicted walks free. But at least we've got an insight into how the rabbis grappled with um, this difficult problem. Any questions or comments? OK, next week, please, God, we will go back to the Gomorrah and we will talk very interestingly about um, what it takes to be a judge. And all I'm going to do now is to um, show you um, is to show you the Gomorrah itself and just read through the Gomorrah uh, and leave it with you because there's some interesting things there that we will uh, go through next week. We're over here by our S. I'm a Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, Ein moshivim Sanhedrin. You cannot sit in the Sanhedrin. Ela baalei koma. Unless you are tall. Baalei chokma. Unless you are clever. Baalei mar'e. Unless you are good looking. Bale zikna, unless you are elderly. Ubale kshafim, unless you know witchcraft. Vyodim beshivim lashon, and you know how to speak 70 languages. Shalot tehe Sanhedri shomat mi piyam so that the Sanhedrin should not hear evidence from the mouth of a translator. Now, there's a lot in there, isn't there? Why should you have to be tall or good looking? I understand clever. I understand even that you should be experienced, elderly. Why should you have to be tall? Why should you have to be good looking? Why should you have to know witchcraft? I understand the language is bit, but those three are a bit difficult. We will talk about those, please God, next week.
If you don't want a spoiler, don't read on. OK, uh, see you next week. Uh, Sunday night, there is uh, in shul yeah. at 8 o'clock, there is a Erev Limud. It will be on Zoom, but I'd like as many people to come in person if they can, um, because it gives a, a, a much nicer atmosphere in the place. Last time we did this on the Shana Rabbah, which was, of course, just a few hours before the world changed forever. We had about 65, 70 people in the room and it was a very nice atmosphere. I'd like to try and do the same again. Encourage your friends to come. If you can't come, listen to it on Zoom. If you can't listen to it on Zoom, you can listen to the recordings. It's a, an Erevli Mud about Judaism and war. I'm going to talk about Amalek. Who is Amalek? And do we still have an, uh, an obligation to kill him? Uh, Rabbi Wise is going to talk about how far we should go in ransoming hostages. And Rav Mendel, I don't know what he's going to talk about because he's given a rather obscure title, which is Asking the Hard Questions. So I have no idea what he's going to talk about, but I'm sure it will be good. Uh, that is this Sunday evening um, uh, on uh, uh, at eight o'clock in Shul. OK, yes, David. So can, we, can we just, uh, um, to conclude uh, the discussion in the last couple of weeks, I, I think we could have spent weeks Discuss. I, I, I found this the most fascinating subject. I'm, I'm still disturbed by it. Uh, I've got more and more questions, but yeah, we need to move on. Uh, can I just mention something about the soup, which I, I just found? Oh, yes. Um, the, this is from the BDB. Marak, uh, the verb is to scour, to polish. We, we're familiar with it from Megillah Esther. Uh, Tamruke Hanashim, uh, um, where where they were cleansed, uh, polishing before, uh, polishing the women, polishing the women exactly, and the idea of marak being the fact that it, that it, it's juice that's spewed out of the meat or, or broth that's being stewed. I so another kind of form of cleansing or or, or separating uh, and rubbing. How fascinating. Fascinating. Where, where's that from? The BDB. What's the BDB? English. Are you not familiar with the BDB, Johnny? No, I'm not. In English lexicon. Okay. It looks a very old book. Uh, I thought you, you, you might have had... No, actually, you wouldn't have had this in your shiver. No, definitely not. I might have, got, might have been one of those things I got for my bar mitzvah and never opened. Well, a bit later, no, you got the the BDP, the BDP, and, and you got this. Oh yeah, I've got one of those. Yeah. Okay, so the two normally went to hand in hand. Oh no, definitely had a concordance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that, David. Really interesting. I'm glad we didn't stop the recording because those who have heard it can now know why Marak is Marak. Wonderful. Okay. See you all soon. Thank, Thank you, you Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Stay well. Keep davening. <laughs>